I think that it's important for somebody who's just starting out to try everything, to taste everything, almost to like sample everything. You're not going to get to the skills that we were talking about earlier if you don't know what you even like. Hey guys, this is Manish here and welcome back to yet another episode of the Arc Gyan podcast where you'll get some awesome gyan on architecture, tech, design and a whole lot more. So today I'm super excited to have with us Michael La Valley who is an architect, writer, web designer, teacher, podcaster and entrepreneur. He's a member of the American Institute of Architects also known as AIA and he's also a LEED certified professional. He's currently an architect and a project manager at Young Plus Right Architects and he specializes in architectural design, detailing, project management, 3D modeling, design research, sustainable design, graphic design and a whole lot more. So he's got quite a ton of skills and expertise under his arsenal. And regarding his background, Mike is a graduate from Syracuse University in New York where he did his BArc. He has over 12 plus years of professional experience in the field of architecture and design. He shares his research, experience and interest on his blog, Evolving Architect, where I found Mike. And he's written quite a lot of interesting articles, one of them being an article about gamification in architecture. He's also a co-host of the podcast called Unpacking Design, where he's done over 130 episodes. Apart from all that, he's also an avid gamer where you'll find him live streaming Minecraft videos on his Twitch stream and also a chess fanatic. So in this episode, he talks about his journey, how he creates content in architecture, podcasting and his company, Evolving Architect, content creation for architects, which is super important going forward as an architect, some interesting tools that he uses and a whole lot more. So for episode show notes, links and a whole lot more, head to arkyan.com slash 53 or you'll find it even in the description below. Now let's jump straight to the episode. This is content creation with Mike. Let's go. Hey guys, uh, welcome back to the Arkyan podcast. Today we have with us a very special guest all the way from the States. Uh, this is Michael Lavali. Hi, Mike. Welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm really happy to be here and uh, appreciate you having me on. Awesome. All right. So let's kick things off. Uh, let, give us a background about yourself and what do you do and how you ended up in architecture. Was it something you always wanted to do as a kid? Uh, yeah. I mean, I, it's it's funny. I think a lot of people who grew up in the in the states and have kind of similar backgrounds to mine uh, remember playing with things like Lego um, and just kind of like building all these little sort of. Uh, I remember specifically as a kid, I had a a set that was like a Lego castle. Um, and I remember like really being interested in making the castle and kind of building it up from nothing and, you know, having little adventures and things like that. Um, I originally actually wanted to be, or I thought I wanted to be a doctor. And then I had a, um, <laughs> I had a course in uh, high school um, where I had like a biology course. And I knew in that moment that I did, I wanted to be more of like a, a technical right. designer uh, scientist than I ever did want to be <laughs> a doctor. So um, from there, I, I took a lot of technical drawing courses and ultimately ended up at Syracuse University, which has a really nice. great um, Bachelor of Architecture program. And so I was there for five years and, you know, loved every minute of it. It was just kind of intoxicating. And um, honestly, it was just, some, you know, some of the best years of my life just being in studio, have, pulling all-nighters, trying, testing all these different things out, learning more about the profession and what I could do with architecture. Um, and that's that's really where I kind of, I, I feel like I had that kind of, um, that real initial bond with the profession where I knew from that that time in school that, I, you know, when, when you have uh, kids that are going into college for the first time and they think that they want to be architects, you know, I, I had a, a class of maybe 150 people and we ended up with like half that that actually graduated. Wow. Um, you, you get kind of thrown into the machine and, and you see kind of like who really wants to be an architect and who doesn't honestly. Um, so I, from there I graduated and in 2008, which 
um, his uh, was very timely because yeah. a few <laughs> months later, um, the entire economy is tanked and it, it was a very interesting and honestly very scary time um, because you know I'm I'm just out of school. A lot of people are dealing with the stuff with the pandemic right now, and it's it's a very uh, eerily similar situation where you don't know what's going to happen. You don't really understand where you fall in the profession, let alone the world. And I felt like all I could do um was to just do my best and honestly just to learn as much as i could about the profession right. make myself stand out so that if you know if anybody had to get let go it was less and less likely to be me um <laughs> as time went on honestly um because i've always had this sort of i don't know general idea that when you become an architect or when you're trying to become an architect, a licensed one, or, or just mm. uh, somebody who works in the profession, mm. you're, you're kind of uh, giving yourself over to being a lifetime learner, a lifelong learner. Yeah. Um, because you, your education, when you start being an architect, never ends. You have to keep up with all the things that are happening and you have, have to kind of put yourself out there more than the average person I think does because you, you know, we, we deal with a lot of, um, technical details and and we create buildings and and art and architecture we also have to be kind of always cognizant of the fact that we're dealing with the health safety and welfare of the public too and there's a very uh, it's kind of like when you start driving a car for the first time there's this responsibility yeah. of being an architect so long story short I, I kind of had that mentality coming out of school like I really want to be the best architect I can be partially because I just have that in me, but I also want to, you know, keep working and keep um, being a, an active member of the profession. So I, I worked for a few years at one firm. I've only really had two major jobs. They've been pretty long standing jobs. Um, one, I worked at a firm, uh, CJS or Central Johnson Stark in Buffalo, New York, which for anybody who's, um, you know, your audience listening on the podcast, it's, it's basically the Western part of New York state. Um, mm -hmm. so, um, it's, it's a, you know, mid-sized city. It's not like New York city, but it's like, a sort of a, a low mid tier, uh, urban environment. And then I, I worked there for, uh, six or seven years. Uh, that was mostly schoolwork and, uh, right. developer driven things. And now I work at another, uh, firm, uh, Young and Right Architectural, which is exclusively, it's probably 95% uh, K through 12 or like uh, kindergarten through um, 12th grade, like right through high right. school. So I, I don't know. At, at some point, I just, when I moved to my second job or the job I have now, I still wasn't licensed. I was just about to be licensed. And literally in uh, September of 2015, so now it's been now I've been an architect for five years. I got my license and two weeks later I started writing a blog and that's kind of, I think probably in some ways, honestly, how you found me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. There was a like blog that, on gamification, which you had written and which was yeah. like really interesting to read. And that's yeah. how I found you, Mike. Yeah. And I, I found that there's been a lot of, um, I started that as like a a way to connect with people like yourself where yeah. you know there's no there's no good way to uh really reach out to a lot of people i feel like uh, unless you put yourself out there so i just i knew as soon as i got my license i wanted to do what was the next thing what was the next big project for my life or you know what what do i want to do next and it was i want to start writing and creating and making things for other people and that's kind of you know we can go into any or you know any facet of that that you want to but that's kind of where the journey has led me awesome and now you have a podcast uh, you do live streaming i saw one one of your minecraft videos as well yeah and, uh, you have a lot of things going but you know it i found it really difficult to have a content creation side sort of business and also mm -hmm. work at an architecture firm because uh, yeah. generally an architecture firm, the work hours, you don't really know how long it's going to take to complete your work. And once you're done with the work, you're mostly burnt out. So I don't know how you manage it and how, what uh, made you get into content creation? How, how did you stay consistent with it? Sure. So I think it, uh, the, 
when I started, I was just exclusively writing for probably, uh, let's see, like a year and a half, a year, year and a half of just writing, writing uh, for a while. It was like one, two posts a week consistently for like almost a year. And I got to the end of that and I was just like, well, nice. I started making connections with people, uh, you know, in the industry or at like other sites like Archetizer. Um, so I started nice. writing as an influencer for Archetizer and that afforded me the ability to start. I was, I was thinking to myself, okay, well, if I, if I'm going to do this, I want to create content for people, but it also has to be, um, in some ways worth it for me. So I need to turn it into a little bit of a business or a side hustle as a way to um, sort of keep, I was still always motivated. I'm not motivated primarily by money, but I, it helps. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so I created a course called SketchUp Architecture, which was like this seven and a half hour epic uh, SketchUp course that nice. took forever <laughs> to make. Um, but it was everything that I knew. And you did it on your I, own, right? Yeah. Wow. And it's on, it's on teachable and it's, it's kind of, it's still going, it's still going strong a little bit here and there, but um, you know, it, it was sort of, I could see that there were a lot of people in my office or around me who uh, I have been using SketchUp for too long. <laughs> um, I've been using SketchUp for probably 15 years now. Wow. And uh, it's it's one of those things where you know it's, you can pick up SketchUp in a weekend, but you can't master SketchUp in a weekend. So yeah. I wanted to create a course where I could teach people the the quote unquote right way to do SketchUp if for an architecture firm. So that if you were coming out of school and you had never touched SketchUp in your life, you could go through the course and then be proficient in it and have those skills to go to an architecture firm and actually you know do it the way that an architect would. So. The problem with that was because it was so intensive, I actually did burn out in spring of 2017. And yeah. I had a moment, had a moment where um, I just, I, everything kind of came crashing down. And it, it was like a, uh, a moment in my life, a very critical moment in my life where I realized that I couldn't do everything. I think that's an important part of content creation is you can't, um, you can't do absolutely everything yeah. uh, for everybody without taking care of yourself and things like that. So I completely stopped the blog for about a year, uh, about oh. a full year. Um, I wasn't blogging at all. I wasn't really on social media except for um, sort of the next part of my life, which was I, you know, lost, I was, I was in a pretty bad uh, health situation where I, you know, I had high blood pressure, high cholesterol. Uh, I hadn't been to the doctor in a few years. It was, it was, it was pretty bad. I had some issues I had to deal with. I was overweight. Um, I had some bad, uh, I was basically spending so much time doing all these creative things that I loved that I wasn't taking care of myself and I wasn't taking care of the relationships around me. So mine is a cautionary tale of, you know, don't, you got to still harmonize the things in your life. I yeah. think the, the positive that came out of it was I took that year that I was blogging and I lost like 75, 80 pounds. Like I, I turned my like personal life around in a way where I have boundaries between myself and my job, myself and my content creation, just to allow me some breathing room between all the different pieces so that I'm not like now I feel way more balanced in terms of, mm -hmm. you know, what I'm doing between all these things, because I have to be, because I don't want to do that again. So I think where that kind of led me to is now the content creation that I'm kind of coming up with is way more about habits and productivity, but um, healthy ways of doing all those things for architects. So my, my mission hasn't really changed in content creation, but it's definitely become more nuanced in the uh, personal development, um, sort of, I guess, health version of that. Um, but for architects, like I can see a lot of people in our profession burning out all the time and yeah. for different reasons, whether it's because they work, you know, a hundred hours a week, every week, or they're not getting the right, um, sort of, uh, advancement in their career and they feel very stagnant or they just, feel like their bosses, you know, don't appreciate them and they don't know how to get out of that slump. So they, they burn out and 
you know, I'm trying to, I think through a lot of the content that I'm creating, whether it's through the podcast or the blog post that I'm doing now, or even the streaming, you know, I'm on a stream and I'm doing Minecraft. It's really just to have fun with people and to say, look, this is what an architect can do. And there's no one way of being an architect. Just, you know, it's, I'm trying to experiment with as many different things as I can to reach as many different people as I can. Um, and I don't know what works yet and what doesn't. And I think that's part of the fun of it for me is you might see me streaming one day and not see me streaming for a couple of weeks, honestly, right. but I'll, I might, I'll probably be back and I'll probably be back with something different and something fresh. And I just trying to keep, honestly, I, I try to keep my audience on my toe, on its toes a little bit because I, I, I want to, um, make sure that I'm, I'm doing the best that I can through ex these experiments and through these different kinds of content. So that's probably why you've seen me dip my toe in like a lot of different things. <laughs> yeah. I think like, like you said, a one man army, uh, in the start, uh, it helps because you get to learn so many skills and you learn a lot, uh, creating content, but over time it starts to get overwhelming and, uh, you start feeling burnt out, which I faced as well. So, uh, yeah. have you started like building a team to help you out with your content creation and how, how are you managing, uh, your content creation right now? Yeah. So I think, uh, I am not. Um, so I okay. guess that's the first thing. Um, the, the interesting thing that I've found is that I have very, it's almost like intuitive, um, sort of, uh, like alarms that go off for me. So like, if I know, I'll give you a good example. So I, I've been really hot on Instagram lately and I've been really trying to push Instagram content as a primary sort of driving force um, for the content that I'm creating um, to bring people into the fold, to bring more audience in, more followers and, and things like that. And, you know, I, I know this about myself that when I decide to do a thing, I like really do a thing. Um, so like I'll do, I was doing stuff daily for, you know, a full month and then I have nice. to kind of take a break from that because I can't keep that up consistently on my own. Um, and I just sense that like, you know, if I'm doing that, I can't do, you know, a blog post and a podcast and a thing, you know, like I have to, I have to be selective about what is the most important kind of content that I'm doing in that moment. Um, so I prioritize the Instagram for a while. Um, you know, I'll, I went from a, uh, uh, like the, the only thing I would say, the only thing that has been very consistent the entire time, and it's probably because I have my friend helping me as a co-host is my podcast. Yeah. Um, and that, that has been a, a good sort of consistent, like we've been doing that for, we just recorded, uh, yesterday, our 140th episode. Nice. Right. So and we've been doing that, you know, it's a weekly podcast for like, however many years that is two and a half years or whatever. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, we, you know, there's that kind of thing that can, is almost like an autopilot. Like I don't have to think about that. We just kind of show up and record a couple podcasts in like one burst and then it, you know, goes out into the world and it's great. Right. Um, but I can't have, not everything can be that streamlined as you know, from just even creating your own stuff. Yeah. So it's, it becomes like a, a, I, I look at what people want and I also look at what energy I have left to give to make certain things. So if I only have so much energy left every day, what can I, what, how can I best focus my energy towards something that is going to help people? Um, as an example, I went from streaming three days a week to one and I kind of put that on pause a little bit, but I'm going to come back to that as maybe like a, you know, Minecraft weekly thing where um, it's still like a way to interact uh, just as uh, I don't know, just to let people know I'm still alive, honestly, too, just because I feel like that's part of the, it's part of the game is if you do too many different things um, and you can't necessarily do them all well, yeah. um, but you also in a social media world, we have to be, kind of be everywhere too. So it's, it's sort of this, sort of this game of what is the most important thing to me but also something that is, you know, do I want to be on TikTok right now? I mean, probably because it's blowing up, but I mean, can I be on TikTok and LinkedIn and stream and blog? You know, like I, you have to kind of make decisions about what is the most, I don't know, beneficial to everybody um, sort of in the moment, if that makes sense. Yeah. And also like uh, 
if you, content creation in general is huge there is so much to learn and architecture as well is so huge yeah. like right. bim and revit and so many new technologies now people are picking up machine learning um do you have any tips on how we could stay ahead of the game like uh, especially for someone who's just starting off want, want to get into content creation and i and i feel that if you uh, document your journey in architecture school or yeah. uh, maybe like uh, like when you start work it would it would be of immense value to you in the long run as well right so uh, oh, yeah. how do you keep yourself ahead of what's happening in the world and uh, you know uh, go with the flow sure yeah no i think it's a great idea for people to you know i think about the way that i started doing it i the my personality type leans towards me doing things very formally so like when i have a blog post i'm typically trying to write it in a fairly formal way it just in terms of its structure right like i know that it's got to be structured a certain way it's usually not journal entry like it's usually like an article sort of format and not everybody has to do it my way i think you could just have a uh, you could just i've seen a lot of people be very successful with just having like simple architecture of logs you know so you're just yeah. showing a video you point your camera point the f- camera that's on your phone back at you spend like two or three minutes just like what happened in your day you know and i think that that could really help a lot of other people understand like what a person in architecture is doing right now i think you know the problem that i have at my at my normal job is that we do a lot of things that are um, publicly funded, uh, things that are uh, the the way that the firm is structured. It's also not my firm. Like I work at a firm that is not mine, but it's it's somebody else's. So there's this, probably this sense of hesitation sometimes I would imagine from people coming out of school, like, can I even show this stuff? You know, like, is this, because there are legal ramifications of yeah. whether or not you can show t- different things. And I would say that's one of the reasons why I started making my own stuff is because honestly, I wanted that complete 100% control over the things that I was showing versus the things that were allowed to be shown. Um, So when I'm streaming, sometimes I'll be streaming, you know, designing a house or I'll be streaming doing Minecraft. And it's, it's more about sharing the things that you know or the things that you are interested in and then getting people excited about that and talking more about you know, so like I, I might be streaming Minecraft, but then we have a really interesting discussion on the stream about modernist design in houses, you know, like it's nice. like it becomes this other dialogue of different things. Um, but for like somebody who's starting out, uh, my advice would just be, you know, pick a pick a social media that you really like, whether it's TikTok or Instagram or LinkedIn, and just really try to understand like how you can contribute. And I think professionally, LinkedIn is a really yeah. good a place right now um, for you to just post your thoughts, to share your thoughts on the career that you have or want, or, um, you know, I've, I found a lot of success in just like meeting different people, you know, just like when we have situations like we do globally right now where there's a pandemic and we, you know, there's uncertainty and uh, people are losing their jobs and there's not it's not a, an upswing in the global economy right now. Um, I think that there's an opportunity for you to, uh, keep connecting with different people and reaching out and sharing your thoughts and your ideas and not asking for anything from them. You know, like it's not, it's not, it's not about asking constantly, like, give, you know, give me, give me, give me. It's more like, um, what can, how can I be of service? How can I help you? How can I, um, you know, you're not looking for necessarily a job. You're looking for ways to offer service as a, when people come out of school, they have so many design skills, just like ready to like be used for, it doesn't even have to be architecture necessarily like straight architecture. It could be logo design or websites. I got into websites designing, you know, like just with the skills I had as an architect and just liking websites. Um, I, I feel like, to stay in front of everything. Um, it's, it's challenging to be sort of the Bjork angles of the world, you know, like it's, it's challenging to just be that person who's always on the forefront. And I, I would necessarily, I wouldn't necessarily say 
everybody needs to be that person. But I, I think that some like right now you can see behind me as we're recording, I have a lot of books. I read a lot. Nice. <laughs> and I, I think that the, the one thing that I've found the most helpful is just to consistently be learning. Um, there's a, there's a quote that I really like, and I, I'm paraphrasing this. Uh, so apologies to the person who said it, but um, uh, Tony Hawk, a really famous U S uh, skateboarder was asked in an interview uh, maybe last year. Um, he said uh, he was asked, well, how did you become so good? He's like, well, I, I just, I just mastered my, skills i mastered the thing that i wanted to do like if i if you really want to do something you have to go out and master that thing i find that a lot of people who are really coming out of school don't recognize the fact that like it takes decades to become a really good architect it's not something that you just do overnight or just like you know like it's just a magical thing yeah. that you wave your hand and you're an architect so personally i find that if you just do things gradually over time you know, I can't read all the books that I have in an hour, but I can read them over a couple of years. I can read them over a couple of decades and I have. So it's, it's like one of those things where you just over time, and that's where I think Evolving Architect came from. It's, it's a, an idea that you're not, you're not in a sprint, you're in a marathon. You're in a long-term committed relationship in some ways with the profession of architecture. And learning as much as you can about the technical parts, the codes, the uh, specifications, just what a contract set of documents looks like. I'm amazed sometimes that people don't necessarily even know how to put a set of documents together. And that's like, the, if you understand the basic things, get a sort of a wide view of as much as you can, and then pick the things that you really like. Like I really enjoyed uh, sustainability and sustainable design. So I focused on that and became a lead accredited professional. And that's now a thing that I just have in my box of tools, you know, and I think you just kind of over time, uh, sort of like just kind of build one skill upon the next, if that makes sense. And I think it's not about, um, trying to be everything to everybody, but just trying to master the skills that you can one at a time and then build one skill over the next, which is kind of the point of the gamification post that you were talking about earlier, yeah. where it's like when you play a video game, which I'm very much a video gamer. Nice. Um, <laughs> I, I see these systems and I'm thinking to myself, well, if you are sort of brought from the beginning of a story of a video game where you have no skills and you have no idea what's happening. And by the end of a video game, whether it's Assassin's Creed or it's, you know, whatever, um, you get these, like, you almost have like this sixth sense of like how to operate in the game and the same, just by having played the game for several hours, you just get these natural like hand-eye coordination things. You yeah. understand more about what the rules of the game are. The same thing is attributed to, or could be attributed to your career or to the way that you, you know, play the game of your professional career and the way that you live your life. You learn skills, you become better at those skills, you get more skills that make you more, you know, I guess in video gamey terms, more powerful or more um, sort of uh, knowledgeable of what you're doing. And then you just keep, you know, you just keep rolling the ball down the hill. You just keep, like gaining more and more energy and more and more knowledge so that at one point you just kind of wake up one day and you just realize that you know all these other things. Like it's not a professor of mine that I had in school described it really well to me. Architecture is like uh, journeying on a series of plateaus. So you gain a bunch of knowledge and then at some point you just kind of hit sort of a, a, a good stride, right? And then you learn a completely new skill and it brings you up the hill a little bit more. And then you coast a little bit, just kind of understanding and learning um, a little bit more. And, but you might not see a lot of growth. And then you have to push yourself to go up the hill again and kind of, you go in these stages. And I, I don't know how to explain it other than you just kind of have to over time 
do as much as you can in the profession and try all these things to, you know, gain all these skills, but you will at some point down the road, wake up one day and just know a lot about architecture or know a lot about design or know a lot about whatever you're interested in. It's the biggest hurdle that I see emerging professionals and young architects getting over is that it just takes time. It just takes time. Like there is no easy answer. There's no silver bullet. It just will take a long time. And it's not the sexy answer and it's not the answer that a lot of people want to hear, but it's the right answer. Um, so yeah, that's what I, I guess that that's a really long winded way of answering your original <laughs> question, but that's kind of where it went. But uh, do you feel that because of the, uh, especially during the lockdown, everyone's at home. Uh, yeah. There's a lot more people online learning courses, a uh, yep. lot more online courses coming up. Um, yeah, generally uh, the best architects uh, we've had so far, they've taken decades to become that really good, right? But do yeah. you feel that if uh, we hack ourselves, like, you know, binge watch a couple of courses, mm-hmm. get really good at skills at a very short span of time, uh, yeah. do you feel that that time period of being a really good architect can actually come down because of technology? Yeah, I, I absolutely think it can. I think that the the caution that I would say is that it's not about, and I, it took me a really long time to learn this thing I'm about to say. It's not about checking a box. It's not about saying I did this course and now I'm awesome. <laughs> like it's it's more about. Um, like let's say you did a course, right? And you, and you took a tech, uh, an online course and it's comprehensive and you learned a lot and you're really good about it or you really feel good about it. I would say, okay, we'll put that into practice. Can you put that skill into practice in an actual project and, you know, with or without help, can you take the things that you've learned immediately into something that you can have a practical application of? If you can't, then you haven't really learned a lot of the lessons that you think you've learned and you've just taken a course to say you've taken a course. Um, I'm, it's funny because uh, the other reason why this kind of comes up for me is I'm taking a, uh, a, a personal like 75 day challenge, which kind of is a habit building challenge. And it's, it's a way for me to upgrade sort of some of the habits that I'm looking at. And at some point I realized that I would, one of the habits I'm trying to build is to read even more. Um, so I have to read at least, uh, 10 pages a day or 30 minutes of an audiobook. And the, the trap that I found myself getting into was those like, wow, I'm burning through a whole bunch of books. I must be learning a lot. And I realized that unless I'm taking notes when I'm reading that fast, it's not, it's going right in and it's kind of going right out. You know, (laughs) like you have to be careful about knowledge because, if you don't have a way to immediately apply that knowledge to something, it does become not lost knowledge because you might remember that you did it. You might remember that you did that course or that you read that book, but you might not remember like what chapter three even was talking about, or you might not remember the lesson from this or that. So I think that technology can absolutely be your friend and sort of rein in the amount of knowledge that you need to uh, let's say like it, it can, it can, uh, bridge the difference between, you know, what the old school version of an architecture professional careers timeline is to something a little bit shorter, but we're talking about the difference between like maybe a couple of years, uh, maybe five years, 10 years, if you're like really all in and like just constantly learning. Um, but I think that, you know, I, there's something to be said about trying to identify the skills that you really, really think you want. So as an example, I knew that I kind of wanted to uh, sort of be the guy in the office who, uh, whether it was, it doesn't necessarily have to be BIM, but I wanted to be one of the people who knew the programs I was in charge of in terms of drafting and in terms of creating the documents. And even since then, when I, I'm in a project management role now where I'm not in direct relationship to those documents, I know how they're made. I know what the capabilities are of the software, and I know the, the ways that people can manipulate the software to get the products that I need yeah. out of my team. And like, if I didn't have that skill, 
um, I'd be in the position that, you know, my boss honestly is where he's, he knows that he wants the paper to look a certain way, but he has no idea necessarily how to, and it's nothing against him. He's just, yeah. he's from a different generation. And it's, it's one of those situations where I knew that there were clear skills that if I didn't have them, I would be uh, worse off later. And yeah. I think that if, if there's like a three or four, five skills that you really can identify early, like I can be the best or I can be the, um, I can be really, really good at something in one of those areas. I feel like that's a way to almost hack the system is to identify the things that you, again, want to master. Maybe you're not mastering all of architecture because that's kind of crazy, <laughs> but <laughs> you're mastering, you're mastering, um, you know, maybe you're really into interior finishes and you are just the person who knows the difference between, uh, I don't know, uh, this kind of door hardware and that kind of door hardware, or, uh, the reason why you would use a, a vinyl product versus like, a, another kind of like a ceramic product, you know, for flooring. And you just understand inherently what the materiality of certain things is. Or you could be somebody who's really involved in historic preservation and you know a lot about really old buildings and what you do when you mm -hmm. encounter one and how you restore one and you're, you're the person to go to, you know, you got to find that, like that niche or that, that piece that really speaks to you. Because if you're the person in the office who can do that one skill, people will come and find you. They will find you for, um, uh, advice. They'll, ask you to participate in the projects. They'll put you on teams that you never thought you were going to be on. Yeah. Um, and you'll honestly probably be more likely to rise up in your office or your firm or wherever you're working because you're the person who, to put it a good way, your boss is trying to identify the people who are leaders by seeing who is taking leadership action. So a real clear way to identify a leader is are they doing things outside of work or like even yeah. during work that are you know um things that are above and beyond that i like as an example i started speaking um uh you know a year or two ago and now i i like it's 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 one of those skills that my employer understands is more beneficial to them um, because now I'm getting in front of people and I'm, you know, now granted lately they've been very, uh, virtual in, in format, but, uh, you know, I'm still getting in front of crowds and, and people who it's hard to be a public speaker. Um, mm -hmm. and, and to, to go and put yourself out there like that, it's, it's challenging, but a person you work for sees that as a skill that they want in leaders that they bring up through their ranks so that they can become, you know, an integral part to getting more jobs or to going and talking in front of clients or, you know, there's so many ways that we can take these skills and upgrade or level up or increase our, our sort of importance or our, I guess, overall kind of um, uh, sort of, inherent level or offering or value that we provide to an office. So yes, I guess, I guess to go back to your original question, I think we can hack the system a little bit, but I just caution that it's more about identifying key skills than it is about just trying to get all the skills all at once. Yeah. And you feel that one of those key skills, I mean, in school, architecture school, we build our creative side, but I yeah. feel that architects of the 21st century, they need to also build that computational side, right? So it's creative plus computation because we're getting into a lot of automation. There's a lot of technologies mm -hmm. coming in. So we may feel distanced out if you're not, you know, getting into the computational side of things, right? Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I think that um, there's, uh, it's sort of scary, um, the, the kinds of advancements that we're making, honestly. I think that the other reason to, get those skills, whether they're through, um, you know, parametrics, algorithms, uh, all the technology that even just understanding the kinds of stuff that people are doing right now uh, at a base level is important because it, yeah. it means that you can have agency 
over the decisions that you make on that skill set that we were just talking about. So like if I know that in 10 years, um, you know, whole parts of buildings are just going to be able to be 3D printed or whatever. And, you know, whatever that technology is, whether it's through BIM or a fabrication method or something like that, I know that I probably don't want to be learning how to hand draft necessarily, yeah. you know, like it, in terms of just like, I want to know how to draw and I want to know how to communicate, but I don't necessarily need to know how to hand draft a full set of drawings without technology. And I know that's like an archaic example, but like it's, it's important to pick the skills like coding, honestly, like knowing how to code something, even at a basic level, whether it's uh, a, for an architectural application um, or it's for, uh, honestly, just knowing how to code in a website, I feel like it is advantageous yeah. because it allows you to interface with technology in a way that is way more technical uh, than to just kind of guess, oh, well, you know, technology won't affect me in 10 years. That's it's, it's fine. It's like, we'll just like, you know, shut our eyes and hope that it just goes away when it's not. I mean, the reality is, is that technology is here to stay. Um, especially we've had the last, it's like the last 10, 15 years, especially feels like it's been going after I got out of school, it felt like everything changed. Like yeah, everything just absolutely. was on this, on this trajectory of like, you know, we didn't have all the social media stuff necessarily kind of fully fleshed out yet, but it's, it just feels like every year and maybe even at this point, every like month, <laughs> there's like a new thing yeah. that is like something to watch out for. And it's exciting, but it's also, it's honestly a little bit scary. I feel like the one thing I do consider every now and then is like, what does the architect of 25 years from now look like? Um, are we, cause I don't, I don't wish this for the the profession, but I feel like if we don't, as individuals in the profession, act soon, we're going to become a um, more of a commodity than we have ever been perceived of in the in the public eye. So what I mean by that is most people who are not like commercial developers or public entities that need large projects, most people don't know what an architect does to begin with. I mean, that's just straight up. I I don't want to say it's a fact, but I'm pretty sure it's that's it's a big fact cool. in India. Man. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, it's hard enough to explain to the average person what an architect does and like what the services are that they provide and the like benefits that you have from working from an arc with an architect. Um, but there's also this, you know, as technology gets better and better. Like, I think the biggest step forward. Um, in the profession was probably the computer. Like you go from hand drafting all this stuff to you're okay. in AutoCAD and you're doing 2D drafting and now we have BIM and now, you know, there's the next level after BIM or maybe like better BIM at some, you know what I mean? But basically BIM is, you know, the, the new hotness right now. Yeah. And so I feel like as automation kind of gets infused more and more into that process, I saw the other day that there's, um, and this probably isn't necessarily like new, new, but there's like algorithms that are generating like uh, apartment house plans, you know, like, and like the, the it's like, it, you just push wow. a button and literally it's like designing the, the way that like a, a space in relation to another space can be designed. And it all works out with like uh, accessibility codes and building codes. And like, it's all just spatially planned. It's like, that's really great. Um, but I feel like at the same time, like, where does that leave room for the architect? Like I, part of the, uh, part of the joy that I get out of designing something is working with the other person who I'm making that design for and like getting their input and trying to understand like what makes them tick. Like if it's a, a an example might be a house. Like if somebody is a really great um, cook you know that the kitchen in their house has to be like the the primary like yeah. space for their house i can't tell a computer that i can't be like prioritize the kitchen and make the kitchen the best you know it's more of um knowing from precedents or other projects i've worked on like i can make this space sing in relation to the rest of the house 
Um, now, granted, I could tell a computer, like, okay, make the size of this this big, and hopefully it comes up with something that looks right or works. But I'm worried that um, in the future, the tools are going to get to a point where, you know, and again, this happens with every generation. So I'm not like, I think there will still be architecture 50 years from now. I think it's just, it's going to look different than what it looks like today. And I think that that's just the thing that we need to not be super scared of, but just be aware of what is changing and how we can kind of change with it so that we're not stuck. Um, And I don't have all those answers. (laughs) It's just more of like, how do we um, evolve again? Like that's, I think that's why I keep coming back to evolve as like my mantra, the way that I see the world, because it's not about radically changing the profession. Every time something new comes out, it's about adapting to the situation that is presented to us. Right. And becoming better as designers, as creatives, as architects, so that we can kind of, maximize the efficiency like there is an efficiency to doing having a computer do certain things and to generate certain things and to algorithmically like calculate a whole bunch of stuff that we don't need to like i don't want to be sitting there with a an abacus and like you know like trying to like figure out all these calculations just let the computer do that that's what the computer does well i think the problem just becomes we don't want the we need to find where the architect role is. And I I think it's the sweet spot is somewhere in between where we're allowing the computers to do what they do best, but we're also giving them enough parameters that we have agency over the designs that come out of that. So you're not using, I feel like sometimes people use BIM as a crutch to say, Oh, well I pushed the button and the building's done. It's like, well, that's not architecture either. Really. I mean, that's just, you know, Revit saying, okay, well, you know, I, I made you a, a, a constructible thing. I mean, did you really though? Because you have to still go in and like edit the details and like change things. And it's not, it's not a complete process and I don't ever want it to be like, I don't ever want the computer to take my job completely from me. I want to still have, and maybe that's the creative side of me. Like I just want to still have that ability to walk into my job every day and say, what is the goal that I'm trying to achieve here for my project? And how am I trying to be of service to this person who asked me to be their architect? Like, how am I helping that person through my skills, through my knowledge, through understanding all the things I've learned, you know, over the course of time, mastering the kinds of things that I'm trying to master? Because it, I mean, I mean, you probably could teach a, a robot to learn all these things or to like Google search all these things, but it's yeah. not the same as intuitively creating something from nothing. I just feel like there's always inherently going to be this struggle that we have as designers to allow certain things to design for us and to take the reins and to kind of design after that. Yeah. Yeah, I think like uh, the biggest employer in the world is inefficiency, right? Uh, and yeah. I feel that uh, because of technology, uh, there's going to be a lot of job losses because a lot of things are going to get automated. And uh, I think yeah. it's good of overall, but yeah, it's also scary at the same time. Yeah. And I think like the, you know, when you, you consider things like the, uh, I don't know, like technology from the like early part of the last century, like horse and buggy, like eventually there was going to be a car, right? And, yeah. you know, now they're talking about how eventually there's just going to be all automated trucking systems that are just going to yeah. like know how to, Amazon is going to be able to like <laughs> send a, a, a truck across the country and just be able to like send anything anywhere in the world. Um, and Drones it might be right. all by... Yeah. And and it it might all be done by like drones and and things like that. Um, And that's going to, that's going to hurt that driver, that person who does that thing. And that there may, that entire swaths of the economy might just disappear. Like there might not be jobs for those kinds of people or those kinds of trades. And I'm really, you know, I don't think that's going to happen to architects, but I really think that it's going to change the way that architects work. And there will be, 
some kind of um, sort of resulting change to the profession. Profession. So, you know, as an example, maybe we don't have people who are drafting as much yeah. um, and learning that process. I think that's the that's the part that's actually scaring me the most is that if you don't have those kind of hours built into way, the way you learn, the way that you do understand the buildings that you're drafting and you give that to a computer, well, I mean, you're, you're not learning enough to then get to the next step to get to the next level and build upon that education. You just kind of have to go from zero to a hundred in like a year. And like, I don't, I don't know what that does to us as architects, but <laughs> it'll, it'll be interesting. Yeah, I'm guessing we'll probably end up like in Wally, -E where everyone's just fat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. I just want to come back uh, to the content creation process. Sure. Uh, do you use any specific tools? Like uh, in my example, I use Notion a lot to structure yeah. the content calendar. <laughs> <and> then, so <laughs> I just want to know what's your uh, tools that you use. Uh, so I started using Notion uh, oh, awesome. recently. Um, I started using Notion maybe uh, at the beginning of the summer, so like three or four months ago. Um, and I've, I'm a Trello guy. So I've been using Trello yeah. for, I can't even remember how long. It's been a, a long time. And that's been my go-to because it keeps me, or it, I guess it kept me um, very streamlined in terms of stacks and lists. And like Notion still has those um, uh, the list features and things like yeah. that. But there's something that's just so much more comprehensive about Notion that makes it easier yeah. to say, here's my database of stuff. Here's my content creation schedule. And it can all kind of flow. Yeah, really. um, the, <laughs> the one thing I will say though, is that Notion is like one of those tools that I feel like if I didn't know Evernote or I didn't know Trello before that, it's really difficult. It's not really difficult, but it's more difficult for the average person to just pick up Notion and be like, yeah, Notion. Um, because I, I feel like it's trying to do a lot of really advanced things in a very minimalist uh, format. Absolutely. I, I love the program, but it's, it's, it's gotta be daunting to the average person, I think, who's never used like a, a Trello or an Evernote or anything like that. Um, I think the, uh, you asked uh, before also about like skills that I think that would be uh, really advantageous to people. Uh, learning how to really write um, and specifically learning how to, it's, it's funny, it's like the, the most applicable skill that I learned from all of my like um, pre-college days was how to uh, type on a keyboard. Nice. Um, like it's just like one of those random courses that you take and it just ends up being like the most Pretty valuable. Yeah. Yeah. It's the most important one. Cause I type so much every day that if I didn't, if I had to look constantly at my fingers and understand how to um, write the amount of stuff that I'm writing, whether it's emails to people or uh, writing a blog post or whatever, I mean, it's, it's a really important skill. So it's not necessarily a software piece, but I think if you, if you're learning something right now, um, online, learning how to, you know, take a, take a keyboarding class and just, it's, it's, it will save your life. I feel like. Yeah. It's very um, simple, right? You just put yeah. four uh, ASDF and JKL yeah. and yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then I'll actually help you honestly with uh, any of your other software you're using so that you're getting yeah. better with the shortcut keys. Right. So I feel like it's just, it's application just grows and grows from, from there. Um, in terms of other software, I'm just trying to think. So I'm definitely using Notion a lot. I'm using, um, I, this isn't really necessarily a tool, but I'm, I'm using Chrome's bookmarks a lot more. And just in terms of like trying to organize myself whenever I'm online or whenever I'm um, researching things so that I don't necessarily put everything into Notion. And the reason for that is, is because I found over time that Notion or things like it are better for productivity and tasks than they are for a comprehensive library of links and things that I've found. Mm -hmm. So, so I still use Evernote a little bit. I, I primarily though, I'm using my bookmark folders and tools and things in Chrome uh, directly so that I don't have to worry about, it's like two sides of your brain. Like one is the, 
um, storing the knowledge and one is the creation part. And I feel like when they overlap too much, it's really difficult to remember like why one thing mattered or like how to reference something. I'll give you an example. So if I'm writing a blog post um, and I need to research something for it or I need to find an article or some source of information, if I use that and just put that into Notion into my one little card that says, here's all my research for this one thing, and then I archive that card and I need to come back to that article, it's hard to get back like through the through the journey that I already took to find that yeah. in the first place. So um, I try to keep kind of like a library of stuff wherever that ends up being and then kind of the day-to-day, what are, what is the next task that I need to do? Um, there's also a good uh, app um, that I've been using lately. It's called Do. Uh, it's D-O-O. And the premise of it is essentially that you um, you plug in whatever you want for uh, the next task at hand. So it's like, do I want to, uh, it could be something as simple as going and getting groceries, or it could be um, writing down uh, my next blog post idea, or it could be, uh, I need to go uh, stream at seven or I need to, you know, whatever. Um, But it lists them. And the only thing that it shows you on your phone when you open it up is that task and you have to complete that task. And then it goes to the next task and then it goes to the next task so that you're not like worried about the fact that you have 10 things you got to do today. You're just worried about what is the next thing I got to do? Because if you do the next thing, then you can get to the next thing and so on. So I found that being able to sort of track your day to day, you know, it's kind of like um, a lot of people out there right now in the self development and self help sort of world. It's kind of one of the things I'm really interested in in just in general is, you know, if you, if you, win the day, you kind of win your overall life, right? Because if you're consistently doing the things you need to do every day that you know will help you longer term, over time, again, they just compound. Those uh, those positive effects kind of compound on themselves. And I think that just by, you know, knowing that you are sort of doing these things a little bit at a time and you're doing them over time, it it helps kind of I don't know, like every day it reminds me, honestly, even though I don't necessarily want to get up and I don't want to, uh, my other fitness goal right now is to walk 10,000 steps a day. Um, right. So, you know, the average person probably walks somewhere between three and 5,000 a day. So it's, it's kind of doubling that. And I don't want to walk 10,000 steps a day. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I don't necessarily want to do that, but I know that for my health, it's, it gives me a good baseline of, what I should try to achieve every day. And if I can check that off and I can say, look, I did this today, then even if I don't want to do it tomorrow, I can say to myself, well, you did that yesterday. You can really just do it again today. And, you know, longer term, you'll either lose the weight you want or you'll, you know, it's all, it's all about these little gains a little bit at a time because the one thing I noticed when the pandemic and the lockdown kind of started was that you know, I was kind of depressed as everybody has been. Uh, I think a lot of people are uh, really depressed about everything and the situation in the world, but I noticed that I wasn't doing my exercises as much as I should. And I was building bad habits and, you know, I didn't wake up one day and I was like, Oh wow, you, you just did a bad habit yesterday. I guess it's going to really affect you. It's like, you know, a month or two into the lockdown, then it started, you realize, oh, I, you know, my, <laughs> the scale looks a little bit different now. And it's like, you know, I gained a little bit of weight back. And um, I, I, I relate the, the habit kind of discussion to uh, fitness a lot because it's the, I think it's the easiest thing for people to kind of recognize, but it also applies directly to career goals. So as an example, if I don't draw any details for a year or two, right? Then that skill will slowly atrophy over time. So even if you're in a mid tier project management role, sort of like where I am, um, I make it a point of fact that I will at some point on the job be in the drawings, be doing stuff, be 
involved in the process. Um, because you just can't, once you get these skills, you don't want to lose them because they're important skills. You you can't let them. It's not something that somebody who's coming right out of school even thinks about because they're like, Oh yeah, I'm right out of school. (laughs) I got all these skills. I'll get more skills. And then you got to keep sort of that daily practicing. If you can, if you can, again, win the day, you're able to succeed. I think more longer term you're, you're doing these things a little bit at a time and they really do add up. I mean, it's, it's crazy how much this stuff adds up over time. Yeah. I think it's similar to playing chess where uh, you keep recognizing those patterns and you keep yeah. getting better at it. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. And you just, you're, there's a reason why the people who play chess at like a really high level are that good. And I mean, part of it is maybe just talent and skill that they inherently have, but part of it is just, they've been seeing these moves over and over Absolutely. for thousands of times that just like, they know um, if you're going to use en passant or if you're going to just like, uh, <laughs> they know what you're, how to get checkmate in like 10 moves. Absolutely. Like, it, it's just like, I, you can't do that without practicing and mastering that skill though. All right. Great. Awesome. Mike, I think we had a fantastic session and uh, I show, I'm sure like we're going to have you in the future as well, uh, dive deep into like specific topics and talk a lot about content creation. That was one topic. Uh, there's one question is, uh, does this come up? Um, yeah, yeah. You know, it's very important to step out of architecture and absorb other fields. Like yeah. uh, I follow a lot of YouTubers like Peter McKinnon, uh, yeah. Ali Ab- Abdal. So uh, how important is it for architects now to, you know, step out, absorb stuff from other fields, which you can then bring back to architecture? Yeah, no, it's, it's really important. I mean, uh, one of the things that I am very interested in, which is we talked a little bit about before, but um, I'm very into other kinds of media. So I almost actually, we didn't talk about this too much, but uh, just briefly, I almost was a, uh, like I almost had a film minor in school and uh, in college, and I almost actually went to film school. So it it was one of those things where I really love movies and my, my, to the point where my final thesis in, at Syracuse was about the, um, the way that film could uh, sort of didactically or sort of like literally translate into the way that an architect could create a building. And it's, it's interesting because I learned so much about that other profession. I mean, you could learn things from being a chef. You could learn, you know, the way that like ingredients kind of sort of come together to create these wonderful uh, platters or, or meals. Um, the other one that I'm personally interested in that we talked about a little bit before is video games. So I highly advocate that everyone who is a designer, uh, I mean, everybody really, but anybody who's a creative designer who works in the graphic field should play video games. <laughs> and yeah. the reason why I think that is because I've been playing them so long that like just a, from the time I was a kid that my hand and eye coordination is probably better from that than anything I could have ever done in architecture. And it's like those, these like weird um, sort of like benefit that you get from, from playing that. But aside from that, you get to understand spatially the way that, you know, like depending on what the game is, whether it's like a, a God of war or an uncharted or a halo or a Minecraft, the camera works in a very specific way but it usually works in a very similar way to like a Revit or like a uh, Rhino or, oh. or, or at least there's, at least there's a way that it can be comparably like um, related, right? Like when yeah, you're making absolutely. these 3d, 3d pieces. And I think that's one of the reasons why I gravitated towards SketchUp the way that I did um, because it just felt like you're able to, it's sort of like you, you get to, um, this place where you're so uh, you've been playing so many games, you you know, over time that you just naturally see things differently. Um, and when you see things differently, you can apply them differently into, you know, a, a BIM application or uh, what have you. It's not just about seeing buildings and saying, okay, well I can go make that building. I mean, sure you can, 
but how do you create an experience, a wayfinding experience through the building that is, is resonates with the people who use it? I feel like video games do that in a very good way in a very like tangible way where you can say, okay, well, I'm leading you through this game. You're going on an adventure with me. You're going on a journey. And this is the story that we want to tell as the game developer. And you're doing the same thing as an architect. So why wouldn't you try to dip your toe into those other kinds of media that are already doing it, but maybe just not, you know, when you play a game, it's not like you create a building necessarily. And like, there's a final product at the end, but it still parallels what we do in our own profession. And I feel like uh, video games and film are very similar in that and that they do that kind of wayfinding exercise for you. And if you just kind of it, like, don't just go watch reality TV. That's not what I mean. It's not, it's not like, you know, like watch a, a contest show. It's more watch like the, the really famous films like uh, uh, Akira Kurosawa films like Seven Samurai or go watch yeah. um, something that like Christopher Nolan just did. You know, like there's, there's ways to understand um, the world through other media. And I think that the, the benefit that we have as designers and creatives is that we can tell probably quicker than others what is a good piece of content and what isn't. And I think that you yeah. just have to be selective about what you're interested in, but, you know, try things or music's another, we didn't really talk about music, but music's a really good one too, where you have to, um, you have to learn a different skill set that is, you know, it's about the process for all this stuff. It's about becoming something more than where you, what you are now, uh, you know, a couple steps down the road. And I would say any of those other creative fields that we just t- I talked about right now, it would be great ones to sort of, you know, research more of, or if you just, honestly, if you have a hobby that really resonates with you, it could be anything. I think what are the lessons that you can learn uh, and apply to, you know, the craft of architecture and the craft of design. And it's just, maybe you just never thought about the fact that like chess is a really great way to become a better designer, but it's a re it's a real thing. I think that you could become a better designer because you're more um, you're able to play a game like chess better. And I mean, I I think that could apply to almost anything. All right. Awesome, Mike. I think that was a fantastic session. We'll jump quickly to the quick fire round. I'll ask you a couple of brief sure. questions and uh, we'll wrap it up towards the end. All right. So, um, which is your favorite chess opening? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. <laughs> it's, a, it's a tough quick fire. Um, you know, I, I don't know if I necessarily have a favorite opening, but I do uh, really really like uh using uh my knights i think the most okay. of like all of the different pieces because i think that the, the the i mean the pawns are more just like fodder they're just kind of like there to like protect everybody right and they're like the the shield um the rooks are kind of uh i don't know they're <laughs> they're just like the thing that it seems like they're supposed to like like blast down the wall um but they're like very aggressive um bishops are a little bit more uh dainty and a little bit more uh i don't know it, it's similar to the rook though where they just have like one line of sight yeah. the thing that makes the knight interesting is it's such a weird pattern that yeah. l-shaped pattern that you yeah. use for a knight is just so wild like who thought like who how do you think of that as a person making a game <laughs> the, like i think that's one of the reasons why chess is so universal because it's it's got very straightforward moves, but then it's got like these very quirky sort of like things that make it very different than like checkers. You know, it's like, it's not, it's not just like a, a simple man's game. It chess is, chess is real. <laughs> chess is, a, this is a real thing. And do you still play uh, chess tournaments and stuff like that? Uh, not really tournaments, but I, I definitely play, like I have a, uh, a set here where I'm just kind of, I'll go online and I'll try to do like, um, whether it's through like chess.com or I'll, you know, I'll do like long distance things and things like nice. that, where it's just, it's just, you know, my wife doesn't really play chess. I, I she kind of plays chess, but it's, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. all right. Uh, were there any mentors in your life, uh, as uh, an architect? Yeah. Um, 
So there's one uh, who, I, the, the two mentors that really stand out to me in my, in my life are my professor at Syracuse who ended up being my thesis advisor. And he had just, he's just one of those guys that had a lot of, um, a lot of wisdom to provide. And I think the thing that I learned from him was how to be a mentor to other people and how to be, you know, to really enjoy being a mentor to other people. It's, it's, it's something that I'm very thankful that I have is like a quality of my personality that I want to teach people that I want to mentor other people. Um, and I think that that to a degree started with him. Um, and then my other mentor that I had, uh, he, he's actually worked at both places that I've worked at. And the funny story was, um, at CJS, he left and, um, uh, when he left, I ended up kind of getting into his role as a project manager for the first time. But then a few, year, few years later, he's like, hey, do you want to um, uh, come across the street? And literally, if you can imagine this, uh, there was an architecture firm on one side of the street and an architecture firm literally on the other side of the street. Like <laughs> you can see them from the window. Okay. Um, and he's like, hey, we have an opening over here. Uh, what would you think about working over here? And I was like, well, you know, I, so I ended up, I wa ended up literally walking across the street and that's where I work now. Nice. Um, um, and since they, they have moved, uh, uh, building, so it's not as, uh, yeah, <laughs> intense, the tension so. isn't there anymore. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the, he has been sort of the mentor, I think that has, like, if I could attribute a lot of the stuff that we talked about today, it's probably to him. Um, and the reason I say that is because, he has a very practical way of looking at a career in architecture, um, but also a very sort of giving spirit in terms of, um, I guess, the way that you can mentor others. Like it, you just really do want to, again, he mentors you, shows you kind of the ropes of like what the architecture uh, profession should be or could be um, and the opportunities that you have for you. Um, but then he also sort of instills that again. I think that's ultimately what a good mentor does is they instill in you the desire to mentor then and like pass it forward and pay it on or, um, to mentor other people. Um, so I, I, I have a couple people like that in my life that have been very fortunate. I've honestly had a very um, sort of positive trajectory overall in my career. And um, I think I can attribute that a lot to the, you know, the high quality people around me. Awesome. Awesome, Mike. And uh, do you have any favorite books or uh, maybe even podcasts that you listen to sure. right now? Yeah. So I, I, it's interesting because I, I think the, it depends on if you're asking about um, architecture or if you're asking about not architecture. I think if I was going to pick one book that was like the quintessential architecture book, I think it's got to be, it's not even by an architect. It's uh, <laughs> the architecture of happiness. Um, which I don't know if you've yeah. read that before, but no, uh, it's uh, by a gentleman, Alain Botton. Um, it's French and I'm probably butchering that name <laughs> when I pronounce it, but um, it's one of those books that is, it feels timeless. Like it's just a series of stories about architecture, but it's done in such an eloquent way that it's so, it makes you want to be an architect. Like if, if that's, that's the only way I can describe it. It makes you really want to be an architect. It's not a technical book. It's not a book about, um, you know, how are you going to design this wall section? It's just a perspective of a writer who's a very creative person who loves architecture. And you can just like feel it emanating from that book. Um, and the other book that I, I think about a lot that I recommend to pretty much everybody is start with why um, by Simon Sinek. And I say that because it's the book that when I was in burnout, um, it's the book that I read first. And I started, I think that's where I kind of rekindled my love for reading uh, was when I hit burnout and I really didn't know what to do. I didn't really know what I should do with my life. Um, I, I still want to be an architect, but I didn't know how that fit into my overall sort of career and life balance. And start with why is kind of a, 
I feel like in some ways it's a rite of passage for people who are interested in self-development because it's one of the books that gets touted around the most. But I think the reason why it's important to me is because it helped pull me out of my own burnout and gave me um, clarity as to why I was doing what I was doing and how I was going to be able to do it from there. Um, so it's a very important book. It's it's probably on a lot of different book lists, but it, it holds special meaning to me because of that. So, All right. And uh, Billy, on that, uh, what are your future goals or uh, where do you see yourself maybe uh, 10 years from now? Yeah, that's like a, that's a big question. <laughs> um, it's such a simple one too, but it's, it's an important one. Um, I think at some point, what I would really like to do, and I don't know what this looks like necessarily, but I really would like to take the things that I'm creating now and whether that becomes my um, complete full-time existence or it becomes a big enough part of my life where the nine to five job um, isn't like right now I have to go to work, you know, like I, I have to go and I have to work at my normal job, be an architect and do that. But I have been speaking more, writing more. I'm currently writing a book. So like, I, it's like one of those things where, I want to have those creative things at least give me the opportunity if I want it to say, I'm going to be this other person now for a while. And, you know, we can't really travel the world right now under these circumstances, but, you know, be able to work from anywhere sort of that. That's kind of my digital nomad. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's kind of the goal. I think for my five to 10 year goal is just to be able to have the option to do that. And, it's it's not it's not a small task it's 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 a it's a it's a very big financial one and it's one yeah. that it's going to take a lot of effort but i feel like i'm i'm trying to serve people in the best way that i can right now by trying all these different things and hopefully it's it's helping people so all right i just have a couple more questions uh, sure. uh which were your favorite games uh, growing up sure um I think my, I mean, chess is definitely, like if we're talking about just normal games, chess is a, is a really good one. Um, it's probably the, I mean, it really is like the best game ever. I mean, for real. <laughs> um, but I, I would say video game wise, it's really always been like the Metal Gear Solid series it has always been a really good one. Nice. Um, the original one actually just came out on, uh, PC again. Um, they just like randomly released it again. And I think I'll probably pick that up because it's just, it reminds me of, and I don't know if this happens for you, uh, but like books and music and games remind me of very specific times in my life. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I played Metal Gear Solid when I had just moved into my second childhood house. And it was, it just, it reminded me of like sort of like this fresh start that my family had at that time. You know, we were moving into a new house. I was moving into a completely new part of the, like I didn't live in Buffalo before, but like we moved two hours from where we originally were to this place. And it was like a whole new start. And I just remember it being such a good game that like, I, it's like forever ingrained in my memory. Um, the other one that I, I really like is Halo. I really like the Halo series nice. um, because I remember in college, uh, whether it was Halo one, two or three, my friends would sort of, none of them were architects. They were all engineers, which was kind of funny. Um, but they, I would come home during the summers and they would be sort of, uh, we would just have like sort of those long nights of just playing Halo, you know, and that's like the one way that I connected to them even through college and um, even sometimes now where it's just like, games i think can really connect us in ways that we don't necessarily yeah. think of but they i don't know they're very powerful for me that way and now the video game industry is massive yeah yeah it's 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 nuts i mean there's 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 people that are uh making such great games that I, i'm i'm really glad to be a gamer now because i feel like every week or every month there's something new that's kind of coming out but it's it's uh it's it's really inspiring to see the industry kind of boom that way and you know i do have that hope for architecture <laughs> but <laughs> all right mike and my last question to you is uh what advice would you give to 
the young architect who's just graduating from school and jumping into the real world? I think that it's important for somebody who's just starting out to try everything, to taste everything, almost to like sample everything. You're not going to get to the skills that we were talking about earlier if you don't know what you even like. You know, you might find that you really like designing, um, I don't know, hospitals. You might find that you like designing schools. You might find that you like designing uh houses, you might find that you don't really like designing, that you want to be more in the development field or the you know construction field, or you might find that you really want to um, write specifications for the rest of your life, you know, but you won't know those things until you try them. And if honestly, your employer doesn't give you all those opportunities, go find them somewhere else and find them on the side, do a side hustle, like yeah. moonlight somewhere, like find the ways to find as many different things as you can, and then you'll have more options to pick from. I think the one thing I find people get um, frustrated with with their careers is they start doing something and they go full gung ho on like one path, don't realize that there's like all these other options out there, and then they get frustrated with the profession. And it's like, well, you got to try all these things. So I, that's what I would say is try everything. Yeah, no, because the internet, you can actually try everything, right? Right. Yeah. All right. Awesome, Mike. I think we had a fantastic session. We discussed quite a lot about content, architecture, chess, games, a whole yeah. lot more. So uh, thanks a ton for coming to the Archeon podcast. It was an uh, honor to have you on and I hope to have you in the future as well. Yeah, no, it was an absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. So today I'm super excited to have with us Michael Lavelli. Lavelli, Lavelli, Lavelli. So today I'm super excited.